Um, you lucked out to have an afternoon session when you could be wide awake after lunch and everything. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, GDPR. Uh, so if you're not looking for GDPR topics, then this isn't the right presentation for you. I uh, wanted to mention first off that um, there's some contribution sprints um, happening this Friday. And um, this is, it's real exciting to take part in sprints if you haven't done it before. So if you're around this Friday, definitely check it out. And there's actually something for everyone. So even if you're not a developer, there's documentation that needs to happen, other things like that. So if you just show up for the sprints and ask for help, the community is always willing to help out and get involved and, um, and, and help first timers and that sort of thing. So feel free to take part in that. Also wanted to mention um, the upcoming Decouple Dribble Days. This is August 17th through 19th. And this is an exciting event um, focusing a lot on decoupled, um, but just kind of the future of that part of Drupal. And um, so look for more information to come out on that soon as far as uh, submitting your sessions, but also just attending registration, that kind of thing. Um, so it uh, looks like an awesome event. Uh, so my name's Don Alley. Uh, both Strop and I work at Media Current. Uh, Media Current's a full service digital agency. We work on helping our clients get the most ROI out of their website. And my team, as the digital strategy team, we focus on the, the content, the data, and the growth part. So GDPR is near and dear to me because I'm one of those people that um, I love to chew through data. Like the more data somebody can give me, the more personalized an experience it can be. So this has a huge impact on the day to day of my team. And I'm Mark Shropshire, and I'm uh, the open source security lead at Media Current. And uh, because there's open source in my title, I really have a passion for open source things. Did and you first the title or the passion? Maybe both. Okay. Yeah, it might be a little <laughs> both, but I, I really do, um, really do have interest in uh, GDPR, other uh, regulatory type things that we have to all uh, work with uh, on our applications and websites. So this seemed like a natural thing for Don and I kind of take this forward and chat about it today. So two different perspectives, but hopefully it'll give a well-rounded picture of the things that we're gonna look at moving forward. So some disclosures, um, y'all, the GDPR is a really, really long document and trying to smash that into an hour is not really possible. Uh, we're also not lawyers, so uh, you know, our job today is just to talk about the scoop about the GDPR, some key concepts, talk about the spirit of the law, but uh, we don't replace your lawyers. Like you still have to go talk to the, the legal side of things to get the full picture. Okay, and today we're gonna kind of just uh, brief through the agenda. We're gonna talk about the guiding principles of GDPR. So just at least a nice outline of what GDPR is about. Um, creating a positive um, privacy experience, uh, security by design, those, some of those concepts, uh, advanced marketing strategies in a post-GDPR world. So how do you take these things that you apply to GDPR and how do you actually still do the jobs that we all have to do, the, take the tasks we need to do that's important with marketing? Um, and then really important is to make sure that we don't freak out. Um, the deadline's coming but um, that we actually have some, uh, some tips and stuff to help on how to plan for it and how to start today. Um, I'm sure everybody's ready to get to work today um, after the con. Um, don't forget our after party though, but um, we'll talk about party that first, later. Then but the action plan second. <laughs> exactly. But, um, but how, so there is, if you just step back, there's some definite things you can do to move forward from today. And, and so uh, we'll kick off into guiding principles yeah. of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which sounds really fancy. <laughs> and very serious. Um, so who's heard of the GDPR? Who's read the GDPR? Oh, nice, that's awesome. So uh, you can think about the GDPR as a broad set of rights that really focus on protecting the data of EU residents. And that's gonna replace the 1995 data protection directive. 
So it's known as one of the most important changes to data privacy in the last 20 years, and we're thinking it's going to impact uh, at least thousands, if not more, of organizations worldwide. Um, the spirit of the law is really to give users rights to their data and put that ownership back in their hands. Uh, so this is agreed upon back in April 2016, and you may be asking yourself, why are people talking about this today, and why are things really heating up now? Um, besides procrastination being an answer, uh, because it is, you know, we have to be compliant by May 28th of this year. Uh, I think a lot of businesses were just waiting to understand how uh, the regulatory process would work, how the enforcement would work, and like with anything, there's a broad spectrum on how you can interpret these kinds of regulations and laws. So I think people were playing a little bit of uh, chicken to see like who's going to say what first, will there be more data coming, and there's still a lot of unknowns, uh, but there's a lot of things that we can take a step forward with today that we do know about. So who's at risk for compliance? Uh, if you can say yes to at least one of the following, uh, you should be thinking about GDPR. Do you have international traffic on your website? Do you have CRM, a marketing automation platform? Does your site use analytics like Google Analytics? Uh, do you have cookies? Uh, does your website collect personal information? And that could be a contact form, or it could be uh, a credit card. It could be very deep. Uh, and can users log into your site? And I swear, these aren't trick questions. <laughs> um, the long story short is, yeah, this could impact just about everybody in some way, shape, or form, and should at least take a look at it. So the GDPR isn't just an IT discussion either. Uh, so some stats that I pulled through, 89% of companies believe that their competitive advantage is going to be uh, based on the customer experience. And a strong privacy experience is interchangeable with customer experience in a lot of ways. Uh, consumers are managing 85% of their relationships with enterprise companies uh, without talking to a human being in 2020. So data becomes a huge part of that. Uh, in 2015, 43% of cyber attacks targeted small businesses. And then uh, 3.8 million is the cost of a data breach for the average company today. And we anticipate that going up in 2020 to 150 million. So this is one of those topics that it really transcends just IT. It transcends just legal. You have to bring your marketing team, your sales team, your content teams, everybody involved in the conversation to create that strong uh, privacy and customer experience. All right, so now we can talk a little bit about some GDPR specifics. If you read, so I didn't see anybody that said they read it. I'm sure some there people have read part. People. Okay, yeah. some people read it. Awesome. I wasn't looking, obviously. Um, I just said a statement. I see you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so those of you who did, there, one of the things I noticed when I read through it was immediately there was a lot of information about, um, you see supervisory authority, controller, processor, data protection officers. Um, so who are these people? Who are these roles? Uh, I think it's, it's good to have a little bit of a basis for this. So the data subject at the center, that is the, the person whose data we're talking about, the person who is gaining rights um, in GDPR. Um, it could be, it's an individual, so it, it, it you know, it's, uh, uh, it's the person that, that you're trying to protect uh, with GDPR here. And then um, supervisory authority, that is a, um, an appointed public authority uh, for an EU member state who you have to report to for breaches and things like that. Um, for a controller, this is the person um, who actually is responsible for the data um, and, uh, and basically they're, they're kind of the boss of determining who is going to actually process the data. They kind of document all, the, all those pieces. Um, the processor is anybody, so, so one thing, if we step back, um, not only do you need to be GDPR compliant with all the things that Don just talked about, um, but anybody who processes data for you, so if you send data through a third party, that would be a processor. Even if that, let's say that person or that, that uh, third party service doesn't really do anything with the data, they don't change the data, maybe they don't even store it, 
they still have to be GDPR compliant, even just the fact they're involved in the process. So that's really important. I, I found that to be in, very interesting. The data protection officer, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but that's, that's a leadership position, kind of like a compliance officer in the organization. So it's real important to have a person who is a, an expert, and this is, this is where it can get a little bit, it, this is where it's gonna get interesting, I think, to define you know, who is the privacy expert and how do you hire for that, but having somebody Well, and, and listen to your attorney. So I think that's important. So they, they're the ones that, so with this said, they're the ones who are assessing risk. So if they say, you know, do or don't do that, I think that's good because everyone's having to assess risk. But, but, um, but yeah, so similar to a compliance officer. Um, and I think key to that and what, what you're getting at right there is real important is that you don't want to have somebody that can create conflicts of interest within an organization. And that's, that's the avoidance probably where that's coming from is to not set that up. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but it's good to read into that. It'll help when you read the document to say, who are they talking about here exactly? So as far as from the overview standpoint, user rights and requirements, um, there's a few sections here. This is outlined on the actual um, uh, GDPR official website, but, um, but we'll talk through each of these, breach notification, right to access, right to erasure, uh, data portability, privacy by design, and again, the data protection officers uh, are key. Okay, so um, breach notification. Um, this is kind of an interesting one because all of a sudden, uh, 72 hours are mentioned, um, and having, if there is a breach of, uh, of data that would affect, and this is primarily to affect a um, uh, where someone's personal identifiable information is affected in the in a breach, um, 72 hours have, within 72 hours there has to be a notification to the uh, supervisory authority. So this means that you have to have everything in order and process internal in your policies and procedures in the company of how you would do the notification. So don't wait. This is you know this yeah. is the place. Don't wait until breach happens because guess what? A breach will happen. We'll just say that, and, and everybody get a little chill, but breaches happen, and they will happen. So have a plan for when a breach happens. How do you deal with that? Who's responsible? How does that work? Um, and individuals uh, need to be notified um, if they're impacted. So there's some, there's also, like all these, there's a little bit of gotchas and. Shop, I feel like you just told the future that a what? breach will happen. Well, I, I just believe breaches happen, and so it's better prepare it's, yeah. It'd be great if they don't, right? Yeah. But it's better prepared so that you know what to do in case they do. Um, but definitely, this is part of transparency, and we'll talk more about that, but you just want to be open with everyone and make sure that they yeah. know what's going on with their data. It's about user rights. Uh, so next is the right to access. So uh, what I took away from this section is that EU citizens and the data needs to be owned by them. So. Uh, they have the right to access their personal data that an organization is maintaining on them. Uh, they've got the right to request a copy. I'm sure you've seen some of this in the news and like Facebook updates about get your copy of the data. Um, and then citizens also have the right to know how their data is being processed, shared, and how it was originally acquired. So it's giving them a lot more knowledge and power around where that's coming from. Um, you can also have the right to be forgotten. So you can request your personal data to be erased on a number of grounds. So first, uh, if that personal data is no longer necessary, you can ask somebody to erase it. Uh, you can ask it for a race for a compliance of a legal requirement, or if somebody is not using your data in the right way, uh, you can also ask for it to be erased under those grounds. So, um 
The next uh, piece here is data portability. And the key points that, that I like for this, this section is really to focus on the fact that users have the right to take their data, move that data, export it from one system, and be able to provide it to another provider. It could be a competitor, but to another provider and import that data. The key here is to make sure that that is done through a process uh, that is standardized. You, it's not, this is not a time for uh, vendor lock-in concepts. This is not, I mean, this is an open source, you know, conference, so we're not talking a lot about that kind of stuff, but, but this is not a time for vendor lock-in. This is a time to say, hey, the person wants to leave, they have a right to leave, we're going to let them export, and it's in a format that's a standard, hopefully some open standard, that is easily imported into another system. So, privacy by design, um, there's a lot of by designs happening today in this talk, but I think the key here is to talk about the fact that we need to think about privacy throughout um, development of applications, websites, systems, that you know, privacy is one of those things, like security, uh, like UX, it's one of these things that we need to think about all the way through, and the point here is to not uh, wait to the end of a process, uh, deploy something and go, oh yeah, we gotta think about some, some privacy here, because at that point, you've probably started collecting data, you're, how you're storing data has already been decided. These, it's too late. I mean, it's not that you can't fix things later, but it makes it m much more challenging. So make sure, uh, so I really like the concept of a privacy by default stance, and that's really to make sure that you are only collecting what you absolutely need to have. So the days are gone of just kind of collecting everything and, and just, hey, let's just take everything, because we might need it someday. Well, the, I'm just, sorry, marketers. Yeah, I both love and hate this too. It, it, it is it is it is tough to swallow, but when you think about like the all the benefits uh, to yeah. users, and we'll talk more about that. I, I totally agree. It's it's a challenge, but um, but you also don't want to hold on to data, uh, personal data, any longer than you need it. So you get to a point and you're like, you know, we don't use that data any longer. That's when you start having the conversation. How do we how do we uh, remove that data? How do we archive it, um, or, or actually complete removal? Because archive is. Uh, another taking on another risk that you probably don't want to have. Yeah, and you know you can back up that thought about privacy by design even to when you're starting to set big goals for your marketing campaign. Taking that into account uh, can set some expectations that have to shift, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But uh, that's what you reminded me of when you're talking about it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Definitely, all applies. Yeah. Um, and so you notice so far we haven't actually said anything about. This, only think about this if you're concerned with people that um, are members, you know, individuals inside EU member states. The reason we're not really focusing on that so much, that is true with GDPR, yeah. and that's an important thing to understand. We believe that GDPR has a lot of great ideas and these concepts you ought to apply to all users. Let's just start thinking about this for all users. We'll talk about that some more too, but um, so here's, um, um, so let me jump to the next slide. I got you. Oh, okay. Um, oh, thanks. Data protection officers. Um, so this is, again, similar role to compliance officers. Um, they need to have the expert knowledge of data protection laws. That's the part that's kind of interesting. It'll be interesting to see what, how uh, entities and organizations standardize on what that means and how that looks. Um, and um, so there are some, like most of these points, there are some uh, places where you may not be required. So your lawyers may say, well, we're actually not required to have that position. Um, so mostly here it's for public authorities. Um, so again, more definition has to happen and read into that. But it is important to know that, um, that every point we've talked about so far has usually uh, inclusions and exclusion type things that have to be considered. So, we've got some key challenges ahead. Uh, now that we've gotten through like the, the bulk of the foundation of the GDPR, we can talk about what to do with it. So some challenges ahead. Uh, the implementation requirements are super vague, so is enforcement. Um, compliance and continued process improvements is gonna cost time and money. Uh, and then there may be other consequences beyond this, but what we're reading is fines could be up to 20 million or 4% annual global turnover for noncompliance. And I think, um, well, we don't know how exactly it'll be interpreted or enforced, uh, but my hope is that there's gonna be a spectrum of, um, you know, 
gross negligence is one thing against somebody who's really trying to do the right thing, uh, tries to, to improve and iterate. But we'll see, you know. There's a lot that uh, we're just going to find out at the end of May. I know, no anxiety. <laughs> so um, everybody's heard of UX and creating a strong user experience. Today we want to talk about how to create a positive privacy experience or PX. And I think people hear privacy and data in the same sentence and think of really nefarious uh, activities and we have to change that perception. Uh, data and privacy, it doesn't have to be a scary thing. It doesn't have to be something that happens. It, the only thing we talk about when something goes wrong. Uh, so some key principles to a strong PX experience. Aim to be transparent with your users. Tell them the full story as much as you can. Don't use lawyer speak. Uh, make sure that the language is easy to understand by anybody. Aim for like a fourth grade reading level. Uh, consent has to be given and not assumed in most cases. Uh, if somebody gives you their data, try to protect it to the best of your ability. And don't collect more than absolutely necessary. Empower those users if they want to be forgotten to be forgotten. And then follow those best practices in terms of security and design methodologies. All right, let's talk um, a little bit about personally identifiable information. So on the uh, screen here, we've got some examples um, from this Wikipedia article on what can be considered PII. Um, and you'll see that listed. I just said PII, but if you see that, that's just something that in this world that's talked about quite a bit. Here's the challenging part. Not every one of these is always PII. So this is another interesting uh, thing to, to deal with. Another uh, risk assessment that has to be handled with, you know, with your lawyers and uh, with management to say, okay, we look at, so it has a lot to do with how the um, data is being used. Like full name might be PII as an example, but in certain contexts, it may absolutely not be. If that, that full name is publicly known and is all over the place, it may not be. Um, so you, what you, what you want to do is be able to take a list like this, and this isn't necessarily exhaustive, but it's a good start, but look at anything that might be PII, and we'll talk more about that as next steps, but you want to identify and document and know. I think a lot of people over the years have built applications and sites, and they just, somebody wants a new field, marketer says new field, sorry, sorry Don, but. I, I know, love saying new field. New field, and you, no one, other than the field kind of showing up, it's easy in Drupal to add a new field, right? So other than the field showing up, you don't really have um, any documentation to say that's actually PII or any other classification, frankly, for that matter. So th that's something that, that you want to be able to do. Um, so we'll talk more about how to protect that too. Yeah, and there are some nice side benefits. Like once you know how you're working with your PII for the GDPR, uh, that'll translate really nicely into the work that you're doing with Google Analytics. So for example, you shouldn't be passing uh, like zip codes or an actual email and a URL into Google Analytics. Uh, so if you're compliant there, kind of compliant in a couple other places. Uh, so we wanted to pull together some do's and don'ts in regards to positive PX experience. So on the do's, uh, the takeaway really is that this is their data. So you have to know what you're collecting, keep it only for as long as you need to, and uh, protect that data with encryption. On the don'ts, don't collect stuff you don't need. Uh, <laughs> and then allow, don't let anybody access that data, really keep it to yourself, um, unless there's a true legitimate reason to pass it over and you've gotten approval and consent on those things. And that may mean that developers, in my opinion, do not need access to production data. Ooh. So if you're, if developers have access to production data that has PII, then take a pause, think about that, and what that may mean. So I, th I think that's an important yeah. point. So as far as um, transparency, um, you want to really make sure that your policies, um, your privacy policies are very clear. Um, Don talked about that a minute ago, just, just having, you know, take out the lawyer speak, that sort of thing. Um, you have to be really clear about with users why 
why you want to collect data, what it's, what it's used for, all the way through the process. And that's not just opinion here. This is getting into GDPR specifics. Um, and, and users, you know, they, they have the right. They have the right to opt in. This is not like we've collected your data and now you have to opt out, which, um, uh, which, which is nice and has been nice in certain cases in the past. But um, as you can see, that, that puts the user first uh, in this situation. And you want to, uh, and again, you just want to make sure that uh, from a language standpoint that it's easy to understand those policies. We're going to talk a little bit about blanket consent in a little bit, but that is a, a thing of the past in a lot of ways. So just because somebody consents one time to one campaign, um, us as marketers, we can't take their email and, and campaign and send them other lists too. We have to be very careful about getting consent at each step of the way. So I think we've talked a lot about data portability already, um, but it's on the, the do's and don'ts. And then on the don'ts, don't make it hard for users to export their data in a standard way, and don't uh, drag your feet in helping them out. All this right. is all you, Shrop. All right, this is, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is Shrop time right now. Security by design, I, I, love, I love talking about this stuff. And, uh, and in the past year, I've been talking a lot with uh, some other folks in the room on that, so it's super exciting. Um, but you really, again, I told you, I promised the by design, you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to wait till launch time and then all of a sudden say, oh yeah, we've got to think about all these things now. You want to think security from the beginning. Um, so um, this, is, this is the kind of a formal definition of that, but again, it's just to talk through, uh, thinking through security from the very beginning. Um, and it, in my opinion, this needs to be driven by your security policies. So if, you're, if your organization who owns the web and digital properties if you don't have like a section of documentation that's um, that's actually part of your process plan and review plan every year, and it's 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 really a security plan is what we're talking about. If you don't have that, I would definitely look at that's a step forward. We'll talk more about that in a bit, but let those policies and procedures drive your requirements and how you build your applications from the beginning. It's real important. Um, and so, privacy uh, and security um, software development lifecycle. So. Uh, anybody that's been inside, you know, development projects, application projects, and things like that, familiar with uh, SDLC. But the point here is just to say that, um, uh, again, this is these are the stages that you would apply security by design through, and, and you could probably insert some other terms and process that you want. But planning and implementation, testing, uh, all the way through documentation, which is really critical, um, and then deployment. And then, and then maintenance cycle. So after that, when you're maintaining applications, that's where it can get really challenging because people get excited about new features. Stakeholders want, you know, want this new feature to do this thing, and and most new features wind up collect. There's some, you know, well, a lot of new features wind up having some web form that says now we want to collect more information. Um, and so, and this is a th th that's a great time to even talk. think about a place where your organization stores all content in your content management system. I'm just throwing that out there. It's very challenging, and I'm not making it, I'm not being, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to make it sound like it's easy, but it's easy to sign up for SaaS services and other things and uh, store data in different places, but I think having those central repositories where yeah. you know the data is and you've got it defined is very helpful. Uh, it also means bringing on new systems is something you have to take under uh, advisement there. Uh, next big bucket is messaging and consent. And so this can impact, um, in these steps, they're not specific to Drupal or your website. You can rinse and repeat on any platform or tool that you're using. So opting in on a website is different from opting in from an email, but it's still opting in, right? Um, privacy policy and legal documents definitely need to be updated. If they sound too legally, it might be a good opportunity to talk to your lawyers to see if maybe they can put it in human language and not just lawyer language. Not that lawyers aren't humans, we love lawyers. Um, and then something that I don't think everybody talks about, but it's important to note, there should be some internal messaging that goes out. So if you're on the marketing team, your goals may be different than in the past. And when you're talking to your boss who has these certain goals around, you know, need to grow the list by this much or this many conversions 
or we expect this level of, of tracking. Uh, you have to set expectations and talk about the value of the PX and the GDPR experience too. As far as like user control, uh, again, just that data portability, uh, having plans for that. What does that mean? What data? So once you've defined the data and the data collection points, those integration points, um, when I have to do a, an export because of request of data, uh, when we have to uh, revoke consent, we have to uh, follow erasure rights to be forgotten type concepts. How do we plan? How would that work? What, what fields are affected? What does that look like? So as far as uh, next steps uh, from here. Um, uh, it's nice when you create a little package for your legal team. Yeah, so if like you, do, you, you do the legwork of tracking down, like here's all the integration points, here's all the data, here's what it means. It'll make it a lot easier for them to go through and assess risk. Because uh, a lot of times these are unfamiliar concepts to legal teams. So they're learning the, the website and the legal side and everybody's interpreting the GDPR. So there's a pretty even playing field. Yeah, they, they, they'll need your help to understand yeah. <laughs> the systems that are in place and those, those, those audits you've done of your systems and fields and PI. They need that to help make decisions. You can't just say, here's the GDPR. Best of luck, lawyers. Yeah, because they, don't, they need to know what, how, what does that apply to in your organization. That's real important. I think as far as we talked about creating and updating policies enough, but that's, that's definitely important. Um, and uh, you want to, from the findings you have and the decisions made from risk assessments, the outcome should be a list of issues and issue cues and a plan for how you're going to remediate any issues, how you're going to deal with encryption, how you're going to deal with uh, those uh, automations of those exports and data uh, changes. So I think that's important. So then implement those remediations too. So once you've got everything documented, next steps, uh, you got to rinse and repeat. It's not just the Drupal website, it's really across the board with any kind of technology platform there is today. So um, it's pretty easy to see the, the difficulties of transforming your company to be uh, compliant with the GDPR, uh, but shifting to a focus on a strong PX uh, I think it's going to do wonderful things for your relationship with your customers, for the positive. Um, and we really feel like this is how the web should work. The PX is the new golden rule. It should be how we work uh, with each other. It should be how we treat human beings. Uh, so it's a, it's a good step in the right direction. Uh, I know we had to get into a lot of the, the legal technicalities, and it can be easy to get stuck in the... Um, Oh God, there's so much to do, so much to figure out. Um, how much is this gonna cost me in time and effort? But I think it's gonna really pay off if you embrace the spirit of the law. All right, so I had to talk a little bit about Drupal to wrap <laughs> this in, because it's DrupalCon um, and the Shrop is excited. Um, I just wanted to mention, there's some, there's some progress already happening with GDPR in the Drupal yeah, community. Sure. And so I think it's important to, like, I, I, we didn't have time to go through all of these, but the, the, the deck's going to be out there and the links are all there in the deck. But um, there's a really lively discussion about privacy concerns um, as GDPR compliance. I even got a node number up there, so it's ultra Drupal geeky. Um, but that's a good discussion because people are talking through what is PI and how does this affect core Drupal, like you know, the users uh, tables and things like that in Drupal. Um, but there's some modules here where people have already worked on like how do we deal with GDPR in commerce, how do we export. Uh, uh, also the encrypt, the encrypt module, uh, and there's related modules to that, so it's not just that module, but that's important on how do you encrypt that data. Um, and uh, uh, of, course, of course I'm involved with the Garter Security Distribution, which is, uh, which is fun, and um, so we're, we're wanting to incorporate more GDPR in there, um, uh, into that work. There's also a GDPR module that looks like it's making a lot of headway towards um, uh, addressing concerns and having some, uh, an API even for some, uh, some audit type things within your site um, to work on. Uh, I'd like to mention too, uh, a shout out to Drush SQL Sanitize for developers that use Drush. Um, that's a great way to put it into your continuous integration workflow so that the developers working on development in lower environments don't have that 
don't have all that data. And of course, you may have to script other things to clean things up in uh, your databases. But uh, you really want to have development happening. And when people take laptops away to conferences, that they're not walking around with, you know, production data with you know thousands, millions of users and stuff like that. Um, the really important thing here, though, to, to to end with this is as you come up with solutions around how you're addressing GDPR, even if it's not Drupal specific, but you like you as a company, someone's determined that this is how they want to operate or they've got some ideas around implementation. I just encourage you to give back to the community here. This is the give back part of this part of this presentation where you say, I'd like to contribute back to one of these modules and help make it better. So there's tons of opportunity if you've ever wanted to get involved in contributing in, in Drupal. Um, this is a great opportunity to dive in. And it's not just on the technical side. You know, at Media Career, we work with a lot of different clients, and I can tell you all of the marketing clients we're working with, all of the legal teams, they want to talk with each other because they're debating internally how to interpret these things, and I think putting out your approach in the community uh, at large, not just Drupal-specific or not just IT-specific, uh, would go a long way to helping improve and um, move things forward, save time. So that's our talk. We definitely want to hear feedback. Um, we have seven minutes for questions. But we're going to be, right after this, if we run out of time for questions, we're going to go back to the, the booth at 525. So come see us, for sure. And the after party, 7-Eleven. Where you can George Jones. party away your GDPR yeah. concerns. Yeah, find us there. We'll be there. Thank you. I just want to know offhand, do you have an idea whether or not there's like a uniform system where somebody, it's like an achievement badge and they say that they're GDPR compliant? Because whenever, like, I run a relatively big site and it's the sum of all the third party um, data tracking software that, uh, that you know, how, how GDPR compliant we are, it's very dependent on the third party software. So uh, do, do you have an idea? There is one yet. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know of one. There, there, I didn't mention this earlier. There are lots of third-party. Uh, there, there's certainly contractors and companies that specialize in GDPR compliance yeah. that can help with that. And you know, it, but I don't know of anything yet. Somebody else in the room may know that's like ISO 27001 or something like that, where you can put something on your site and say that we are. But it's a good idea. Yeah, that probably will I, come after the end of May. I, I, I'm sure you could start a business doing that. Um, Two, I have like a million questions actually, but two, <laughs> can, I, can I fit two in? So the first okay. one is, how does something like Google Analytics tracking users count against this? Is that a, like a, in a separate world or are we accountable for actually um, providing GA tracking on from our site to the user? Yeah, so uh, I'm not a lawyer <laughs> and I've had uh, different lawyers of my clients interpret that uh, on like two ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So I have one client who says, Don, you cannot fire any Google Analytics cookies whatsoever until somebody says, yes, right. I support you doing that. And that does um, crazy things to their data. Mm -hmm. um, on the other end, I have a client that has said that this is okay to be passive consent. That as long as we're not pushing anything uh, PII in any way, it's, it's okay to collect general uh, usage data. Right. So it's talk to your lawyers yeah. <laughs> to see where it's what like level of risk yeah, yeah, yeah. they want to take on. Yeah, um, so the, the, the second question briefly is um, it has to do with cookies. Mm -hmm. And it's been explained to me, perhaps incorrectly, that there are three categories of cookies in GDPR. There is what's called required. Mm -hmm. There is, which is like your login cookie. There's something called functional. And there's something called advertising. It's really and nice to put that in your package for your lawyers. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's happened in, in my company is that the marketing team has decided that everything is required. <laughs> Problem solved. Does that, I mean, not everything. So, so someone's going to, if there's ever any action on GDPR, then they're going to look at that and they'll they'll tell you where they're where you're wrong or where the <laughs> person made the decision. I, I wish they would give us the examples risk. up front. Yeah. Is it, they may say, well, good try, but you know, so it's it's probably good to to look at those. Like you know, session cookies, for instance, are different, you know, than, than marketing tracking cookies and things like that. 
Right. Well, we have our own types of marketing and tracking cookies, which are not third party, but they're you know for personalization purposes gotcha. and things yeah. like uh, that. Yeah, personalization is huge in this for sure. And so it's a, it's a good reason to talk somebody into opting in. Right. Yep. If, well, I'm guessing. Yeah. It's a that'll yeah, be a fun conversation between you and marketing. <laughs> I understand you're not lawyers, but I'm curious. It's good to see you again. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could share y'all's opinion on where PII stops or how far it extends rather. You know, it's the GDPR is intentionally vague um, with things like anything directly or indirectly um, that can identify a user like physical location. Well, address, that counts as address because it's address states count. Because states count, does that mean time zones count? If time zones count, does that include time stamps if we could collect peak usage time of users? Uh, I was wondering if you could expand maybe where you currently stand or how you understand how far that extends. Because like that, oh, my okay. concern is like, are our Apache access logs, do those yeah. fall under GDPR? They, they could. Logs can. Right. IP addresses. You didn't mention IP, but I know uh, that was probably IP, next on the list. I, I feel confident IP addresses are. Yeah, um, yeah but like that's how a good far, call. We, like, yeah. Are our timestamps in, like, in our database records, are those subject? I mean, so here's what this is about in my opinion, not lawyer, is, is it's about <laughs> taking the diff, those independent pieces of data, can you build a profile and really identify who that is? That's where it gets into the play. Now, um, time is obviously a factor that can help identify people. In a log, it, personally, I don't see that usually in a general sense as much of an issue, but I definitely see like IP, I see, uh, I see you know, URLs, I see uh, things like that showing up in logs is definitely an issue. Something we didn't talk about a whole lot, but something that's on my mind a lot is backups. Right, uh, that's are, terrifying. Yeah, so what are we doing for backups? That's something we need to figure out because um, you know, it's great. I, as a developer, I like to be able to just say, I've got backups way out there. That's right for But that's holding stuff. It goes back to the encryption and being able to, you know, delete keys. Uh, but, what, but we still have to deal with things that don't have those implementations. So um, I, I, it really depends on every project. So just like Don was talking about, yeah. we, PI is, di is determined in conjunction with, for us, our clients, uh, what, what we recommend and their, their attorneys to say, this is what we think. Because it really comes down to how is it used, how can it be combined. Um, encrypting this really does help a lot uh, because you're worried about breaches, you're worried about if someone else gets their hands on this. So you, you, you may ha not be doing anything with the IP address or you know, the, the URLs or you know, some other piece of data, but if someone else gets their hand on that, Right. Hands on that. What can they do with it to put together a profile of somebody? That that's that's what bothers me a lot from a breach standpoint. Uh, the, the encryption is a really good point. Like the less data points it you give them, the less so much. of a profile you could build. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. Sure. So I think I this has to be our last question. When do we get kicked out? I think. I don't know. Soon. Very soon. Okay. I'm curious about the scenario if your site isn't targeting the European users, maybe if it's not targeting humans at all, you're making for like aliens or robots, like do you still <laughs> need to be uh, GDPR compliant? So I think it's a good thing to do for other human beings. Um, we have some clients whose legal teams say we can only absolutely do business in uh, the United States, and uh, we are going to scrub. If somebody from Europe comes in, submits data, we're not going to save that data anyway because we're not going to use it. So uh, that makes them kind of compliant, right? Because they're not keeping the data, but uh, you have to take the steps to do that. And then I think it comes down to that level of risk you want to assume uh, with the aliens to you. I mean, like extra extraterrestrials, <laughs> like uh, like extraterrestrials. It, it's hard yeah. to have. A, it's a website. It's on the internet. So my thing is, like, how are you not going to ever have somebody yeah. from an EU member state oh. involved with your site? That's. Yeah. I have. I, I'm having trouble coming up with scenarios. I guess there probably are, but. But the likelihood of that site being the first one somebody audits may be slim. So again, like uh -huh. that that risk thing. Got it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You're cool. welcome. Thanks. That was a fun question. Yeah, that was good. That was good. I like the UFO action.
Uh, one more. We'll make one you more. the last. Uh, we'll... Yeah, I would just like to say uh, thank you. First of all, it was a very good general overview. Uh, but there's a mistake that it said EU citizens, and it's not for EU citizens. It's for EU individuals. So I, as a resident in Europe, even though I'm from the U.S., uh, my data also has to be compliant with GDPR. That's exactly, you're and, exactly right. Yeah. And just a quick advertisement, uh, we created the GDPR audit module. Oh, cool. So oh, nice. um, if anybody would like to talk to us, uh, these two here, or myself. Uh, What's your name? Riley. Riley? Uh, we're from Brainsome from Budapest. And uh, we'd be happy to help anybody yeah, else. I'd love with to chat, because yeah, sure. I'd love to get something like that in Garter. Yeah, and this is crazy complicated. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, everybody. Hey, how's it going? Hey. Hey, Jam. How you doing? Good, man. Good to see you. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. So, we debunked our situation. Yeah. Uh, we had a lawyer come in and give a GDPR talk. Oh, cool. At a recent open source event. Listen to them more than what you mean. She's wrong. Okay. Like, I have a big problem with okay. it.